Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast sponsored by DECRA. We're going to give our attendees just a minute or so to get settled with us today, and we'll be starting the event in just a minute or so. Thank you. Thanks again to everyone who has joined us so far. We're going to give our audience just a moment to get settled in, and we will begin our presentation today shortly. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast, The Connected Leader, Cultivating Trust in Today's Disconnected World, sponsored by DECRA. My name is Barry Botino, and I'm an associate editor at Safety and Health. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's event. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to share with everyone. As a disclaimer, the views of today's speakers and organization are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorses those items. After today's presentation, we'll conduct a Q&A with our speakers. If you have a question, just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen type in your question and press the send button. You don't have to wait for the Q&A to begin to send a question. We welcome your questions at any time at all during today's event. After this presentation, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, but I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. Finally, this webcast will be archived. If you'd like to view this presentation or any of our past webcasts, you can visit us online at safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's introduce our presenters. With us today are Angelica Grindle and Rebecca Timmons. Angelica is a Vice President and Executive Consultant Lead in DECRA's consulting practice. As a behavior analyst for more than three decades, Angelica specializes in creating safety excellence through the application of behavioral science at all organizational levels. She helps organizations tailor their change initiatives based on unique needs and to generate the necessary support from key stakeholders. Rebecca, who is a senior vice president and leads the consulting practice at DECRA, is an organizational safety industry expert who has helped organizations improve their business outcomes by cultivating strong, positive cultures for more than three decades. She specializes in executive leadership development and has worked with approximately 500 leaders from more than 50 different organizations. Again, we thank you all for tuning into this presentation. Angelica, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Rebecca and I are very happy to be here with you all today. You'll see a quote on your screen. I really love this quote. You know, when you think of an organization that excels at safety, one key attribute is that people will readily share safety concerns and innovative ideas with their leaders. However, when the connection between leaders and their reports isn't there, this important sharing doesn't happen. And the result is that there's, there's really a limit on what that organization, on what that leader can achieve. Simply put, without connection, safety excellence is impossible. Now, I, I think it's pretty fair to say that we live in some interesting times. Uh, the last few years have, have really upended how we work at every organizational level. Um, first off, in, in many organizations, you have people who may rarely, if ever, see each other face to face. All of their interactions are done through computer keyboard or screen or on their phone or you know, calling, texting, um, but not necessarily face to face. Add into that unique roles within the organization. For example, supervisors. 
you have people who already have a really difficult job being in that hard space between frontline employee needs and upper leadership's goals. Nowadays, these supervisors are trying to get that same work done, often without the level of staffing that they need. And when they do fill these roles, they need to make sure that these new employees learn their new job and stay safe while they're doing so. Um, supervisors also need to help their team function as a true, as a true team, as a, as a good, solid working group in a time when there's frankly very strained interpersonal relationships out there. Now, let's add into this that historically you find that frontline level leaders get that job, get that position, because they were really good as an individual contributor. However, the skills that you need to be, say, a great uh, mechanic are not the same skills that you need to be a great leader. And frankly, many organizations really don't do a good job of helping frontline employees build these important leadership skills. So with the recent levels of turnover most, most organizations are facing, you may have frontline level leaders, supervisors, facing the challenges that they've always faced, um, as well as the new ones, and add into it, they're new to their role and they may not have had the developmental opportunities that they need to be successful. Now let's talk about managers. Uh, things, are, things are a little interesting for them as well, because besides the normal challenges of their roles, today they must now also figure out, you know, how am I gonna meet production goals when the supplies that I need may be difficult or sometimes impossible to find? Um, managers must also meet financial targets in a time where, where prices are, are rising and, and people are worried about recession. They also have the, the very challenging job of trying to forecast what tomorrow's customers will want, which can be incredibly challenging. And of course, they have to pull all of this off when they may, they may too have a, a gaps in the ranks of those who report to them. For all employees at, at all levels, there's also this, this reality, we see it in the newspaper a lot, of high levels of, of disengagement and burnout, that quiet quitting we keep reading about, um, decreased satisfaction, um, unfortunately record levels of mental health challenges, as well as people just, just being worried, right? Grocery prices are rising, housing costs, rent, um, and people being worried about the well-being, not only for themselves, but also for their friends and their families. Unfortunately, over the last couple of years, work has become kind of transitory for, for many folks. Um, there have been staff reductions and high employee turnover, and this results in the culture of work groups changing. Additionally, the political and social environment has led to high levels of stress, anxiety, and burnout, which not only impacts the experience of the individual, but also impacts the culture of our work groups. In many industries, it's still difficult to find talented employees who will stay in the organization and bring that much needed stability to our work groups. This is the world that most of us live in. And to move forward, leaders need to be mindful that ex employee expectations are different today. We need to remember that people want collaboration, they want development. They want to know that not only is their work valued and their work important to the organization, but they are valued as individuals. And they not only want their organization and leaders to prioritize their well being, but, but they really expect it. Gallup, uh, you'll see on your screen here, Gallup released some data recently that, that really underscores these points. In comparing 2021 to 2022, they found that people's confidence that their employer would do the right thing if they raised a concern about ethics or integrity went down five percentage points. Um, whether people felt that they were treated with respect at work went down seven. And when asked if someone at work, uh, if there was somebody at work who encouraged their development, this score went down by five percentage points. The most stunning was about around people feeling that their organization cared about their well-being. This went down 14 percentage points in just one year. You know, this is really important. Think about it. Some, some, uh, some other recent research that came out shows that employees who strongly agree that their employer cares about their overall well-being are three times more likely to be engaged at work. So think about all the things we talked about that, that we want to see in a really solid culture, right? People that, are, that, that feel that their employer cares about their well-being are three times more likely to be engaged. 
they're 71% less likely to report experiencing a lot of burnout and 69% less likely to be actively searching for a new job. Now think about what this means for how connected people are to their organization and to their leaders. You know, how willing will people be to, to raise safety concerns, to develop and share innovative ideas for improving safety, you know, to approach people at risk or to volunteer for initiatives? You know, many organizations are, are still really struggling with cultivating employee trust and building this critical connection. And so, you know, Rebecca and I have chatted about this and in our experiences in talking with different leaders, we're hearing a lot of questions such as, you know, how do I build or how do I rebuild employee trust and, lo and loyalty to the organization, you know, and to me as a leader? Um, how do I create a workspace, whether it's in real life, but, you know, face to face or whether it's virtual, that mixes a really vibrant employee experience along with a great coast customer focus and strong business outcomes. Another question we hear a lot is, is how do I know what's going on? How do I know what employees are experiencing? And how do I create or repair strong, positive relationships? What we tell them is the answer is to become a connected leader. If you're a connected leader, you build a culture in which your employees have strong trust in you, and they also have a better experience. There's increased job satisfaction and productivity, increased confidence and feelings of, of being respected and recognized for their contributions. Um, you see people uh, working more independently and having open, open uh, communication and that increased commitment to the job. In terms of safety, this means that connected leaders build safety champions in their organization. So this is, this is what it means to be a connected leader. Um, Rebecca, what strikes you about this? What are you seeing with organizations you work with? You know, as I listen to you, Angelica, and I look at the data on the screen, um, I think about all our clients and what a really tough job leaders have today. We talk about the new world of work, but in all honesty, all the things that we had to manage before the pandemic are still with us. Mm -hmm. So not only do we have the what I'm gonna call the old standard challenges, we've layered on top of that all the new challenges coming out of a global shutdown of work. But as I was listening, especially on this particular data, you know, we know what it takes to have high functioning in an organization. We know the really important impact of strong employer supervisor relationships and the impact on how the organization operates more importantly, how the employee feels or sees the operation. We know how critical it is to have people be able to raise concerns upwards, not just for safety, but generally for operational functioning. And we know that a leader without credibility is really in a tough spot. And as I listen and look at these numbers, that's what comes to my mind is the challenge we have is not only do we have to do all the things well that we've always known, but now we're challenged with how do we pivot and incorporate some of the key things from a personal relationship standpoint, from a well-being standpoint, that is so important to employees today? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think about the saying um, that I love that good safety is loud, right? Um, and so as a leader, you want to have that people have that trust where they feel comfortable putting their hand up. Um, you know, it's the opposite of quiet quitting, right? It's stepping up and it's saying, hey. I'm concerned about this, or hey, I have this great idea of how we can reduce exposure. You know, we want that level of chat, or we want that vibrant communication. And to get there, you've got to have that connection with folks. When I think of the employee today, they have different expectations. And one thing that keeps coming out loud and clear, not only in the data and the surveys, but in our experience, is that employees want to know that their organization and their leaders care about their well-being. And when I look at that last piece, um, down 14% in a year, I think that's really concerning because that tells us that we have a lever to engage employees, to retain employees that we're not pulling. Yeah, absolutely. I shared that data employees that uh, that believe that their employer cares about their well-being 
three times more likely to be engaged, 71% less likely to, to report experiencing burnout, and 69% less likely to be searching for a job. Yeah, so when you think about the stability of the work group, if that lever, right, that, that lever you just mentioned, 69% less turnover, right, theoretically. Um, so that that's big. That's big by just simply getting it across to people and creating that connection and building those relationships. And I think we have a poll now. So I'm going to pop it over to Barry. Great. Thank you, Angelica. We, we want to take the time today to... Um listen into what our audience is experiencing. And our question today is, what are you experiencing most in your organization? We have five different options for you there today for all of our attendees. Please pick the top three. Uh, our options are strained work group relations, inexperienced new leaders, inexperienced new workers, quiet quitters, and well-being struggles. We'll give everybody about 30 to 45 seconds to weigh in on this. Uh, feel free to choose those top three, as we mentioned. And I see, Barry, somebody asked a question about what is quiet quitting. Um, yes. in, in, a, in a nutshell, quiet quitting, quiet, that, quiet quitting um, is really where their people are showing up. They're, they're technically at work, but they're really just doing the minimum to get by and, and get out of troubles. They're not doing, they're not stepping up. Great. Thank you for sharing that. We appreciate it. And we'll give everyone a couple more seconds before we close out the poll here. Okay, it looks like we've got a, a, a tight race here. Yes. Our, our runaway leader is experience, inexperienced new leaders, mm -hmm. followed by inexperienced new workers, and then strained workgroup relations. Uh, but it looks like all five uh, are, are things that folks are experiencing in our audience today. Angelica, any thoughts or surprises about what we're seeing here? No, not surprising. Um, the two things stand out to me. First is that whether it's inexperienced new leaders or inexperienced new workers, those coming out is, is the top two. Um, overwhelmingly, that's probably the first thing I hear when, when I chat with organizations about what they're experiencing right now. Um, the other thing that, that I notice is all of the other things, the work group relations, the quiet quitters, the well-being, those all kind of interact with each other, right? Um, you know, if I'm having having well-being struggles or I don't feel my organization cares about my well-being, that's going to strain work group relationships. I may then become a quiet quitter, right? They all kind of, kind of tangle together. Um, Rebecca, what are your thoughts on this? The thing that strikes me the most is the impact on safety and exposure. So we know coming out of the pandemic that exposure has gone up for many reasons. But when I look at the response here, that just further reinforces it for me. Yeah. Um, all of those things directly or ind indirectly impact safety. And I think that just adds an additional level of responsibility to leaders today mm -hmm. to ensure that their employees are teed up, understand exposure, most importantly, know how to control it and can surface it when they need help. Yeah, yeah. And what we saw a lot as well is, is uh, during the pandemic, uh, uh, organizations, the COVID became the thing, right? That was the focus. And nobody was, most, most of us, um, if not all of us, uh, we weren't ready. And so this happened and organizations were scrambling to try to figure out what to do, right? Um, and what, and what I've, I've seen happen in a lot of organizations is the block and tackle safety, the foundational things, the training, um, it, it just sort of all got back burnered as organizations were responding to COVID. And uh, for at least for the organizations I'm talking, I've been talking with, they're still coming out of that. They're still trying to get their feet under them, um, which is made more difficult with the fact that there's a lot of new people in their facilities. I think we all want it to be over and we all hope that it'll be over shortly. But what I'm seeing in the field is that organizations are still figuring out how to successfully emerge from this period. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So Rebecca, um, what does was, does a person do? And for those on the line, you know, what are some things that they should be thinking about in terms of their leadership? That's what I've been thinking also. So what is a leader to do? And I do think that you have to go back to the basics. 
So what I've shared here are um, a number of questions that I think can really help you as a leader think through what sort of culture do you wanna create for your workforce, perhaps if you're a senior leader for your organization. And there are a couple here that I really wanna highlight. Yeah. So I do think, oh, sorry, Angelica. Well, I was just gonna say, while we're going through this, if everybody wants to be kind of thinking of themselves, how would I score on this? How am I doing in this area? Kind of self-assess. Um, I think it's time to go back and revisit your vision, not just as an organization, but as an individual leader. What do you want your slice of the organization to look and sound like? If you're a senior leader, what do you want the culture of your organization to be? And are you able to speak to it in an interesting and compelling way that helps others see how they connect and can be part of success? The next one is just foundational. If you're a leader without good credibility, particularly if you're a safety leader, um, you are in a very tough spot because without credibility, leaders have a very difficult time influencing. And so for those of you with strong credibility, I encourage you to protect that. If you're in a situation where you might need to do a little recovery work, do that because it will pay dividends to you and your ability to move your group from point A to point B. We talk a lot about leadership, but what really is it at the heart of it? It's the ability to mobilize a group and move them from one point to another point. And so as a leader, your credibility is so valuable to you. We've already talked about the importance of well-being and employees believing that their leader and their organization really cares about them. It's been very tough the last several years to collaborate, particularly where you're working with a virtual workforce or perhaps a hybrid of that, but it really forces the leader to be pretty creative in terms of how do I bring folks together in a way that makes sense so that they can collaborate on problem solving and really that underpins how teams work together. Do I communicate information in a way that is understood and that people can relate to? Um, I think that's another example where you've got to really think through if it's a virtual environment, how am I doing that? Am I hitting the target? I might think I'm a great communicator, but the real test is, is the message that I'm trying to convey, is it connecting to, to my audience? Number six is all around action orientation. And it's often hard, particularly where there's so much uncertainty and unknown about what's gonna happen in the future, it's easy as a leader to get bogged down and wait a little bit longer to perhaps get a little more clear understanding, a little more perfect, perfect information. And I think we have to really fight that tendency. As a leader, you want to stay action oriented and you want to start. And if you need to adjust as you go, adjust but really guard against getting paralyzed and waiting for the perfect situation to take action. I think employees are really looking at this and when they see an action or they see hesitancy to act, um, I think it makes them think things that aren't particularly helpful. I think it raises questions about the leader's competence, their credibility, their understanding the work um, and all of those things don't help us. Do you share feedback and let others know how they're doing? This is one area that I have seen be really tough in organizations since we've gone to a virtual hybrid, um, particularly with newer leaders, newer supervisors who may not have the same feedback skills or understand the work to the same degree that people did three or four years ago. So I think this one, I would star this one along with credibility because I think they really pay dividends for efforts from a leader. Um, but are you regularly letting people know how they're doing? We often let people know when they miss the target because it becomes very visible. But I would challenge you to look for lots of, the, lots of work that's happening around you where people are doing really good work or they're really making improvement. And your ability to pinpoint that and comment on it, it's really helpful. It doesn't have to be a long drawn out event. It can be as simple as, I noticed when you were taking that pump apart, 
that you followed the protocol and that you did an excellent job of controlling exposure. You stayed out of the line of fire, you had the correct gear on, and I want you to know I appreciate it. Feedback can be just straightforward. The key is, is that you pinpoint the behavior or the practice that you're trying to reinforce, and then you talk specifically to that and tie it to the success of the work. Do you practice fair accountability? There is always interest in increasing accountability because we know with good, strong accountability, performance is better. Not just safety performance, but operational performance. And whenever I think of that word, I always break it into two words, account and ability. And the temptation is to start with accounting and I wanna encourage you to start with ability. So as a leader, have you ensured that your team your individual contributors, that people have the ability to perform to the standard required. Are they set up for success? And as a leader, if you've done a good job at that, um, you can feel good about then going and having an accounting of performance where you can talk about, here's what worked well and here are the outcomes of that. Here's where we missed the target. Here's the outcomes of that. And here's what I want you to do differently. I think sometimes we leave accounting uh, till the end of the year for performance reviews. I, I bet many of us have just gone through a bunch of performance reviews. Very important to do um, in a systematic way. But I think when we think about fair accountability, the payoff to the leader is to be practicing that really across the year. And then the last one is, do you cultivate strong positive relationships? And this is above, below, and across the organization. We know that as a leader, when you have good relationships, that, that's the position in which you can influence. And the payoff, not only to you as a leader, but to work group relations, to problem solving, when there are strong relationships is just great. It's easier for people to raise concerns. It's easier for people to ask for help. And it's easier for people to share when they see good work happening. So I encourage you to Take these questions, print them out, and think through them, maybe think through them with your teams. Um, I know they're basic, they're fundamental, but they work. What I see is that leaders who are able to look at, look at these questions and really not just answer them for today, but also use them as a way to sort of strategize and what you want the future to look like, um, it's very powerful. And those leaders that are focused on things like this also tend to be more connected and allied with their teams. And that is all to the good. What are you thinking, Angelica? Oh, I completely agree. Um, you know, it's it, the slide is titled Back to Basics for a reason. And, and I think that's, I mentioned earlier about how COVID and, and everything that, that happened alongside it, uh, sort of disrupted how we do business and it also in how we how we led in safety and our safety management systems but it also disrupted a lot of, of how we lead and so getting back to basics yeah. whether it's your safety training or whether it's you as a leader um, identifying okay where may I where have things maybe have gotten a little off the rails and what can I do to, to bring it back um, so I hope everybody was thinking a little bit about themselves as they were listening to Rebecca's great description, because we have another poll for you. Well, thank you, Angelica. We do want to kind of take those nine questions and build off of them with our audience today. And we want to know, how did you do? Answer by, I'm doing great. I have a few things to work on. Or hopefully not, I'm a hot mess. Let us know how you how you feel you're doing on those nine questions. We'll give everyone about 30 seconds here to go through the poll and give us your answer. And thanks for those who have submitted questions so far. We will have the Q&A at the end of our event. So feel free to send in those questions. We'll get to as many as we possibly can in the time we have. We'll give everyone just a couple more seconds, then we'll close out our poll today. Really interested to see how everyone did. Okay, the far and away leader, 87%. I have a few things to work on. 11%, I'm doing great. That's wonderful. 
And thankfully, only 3% say, I'm a hot mess. Rebecca, can you share some thoughts on, on what folks have responded to here? Absolutely. First off, I want to acknowledge the people that say I'm a bit of a hot mess. I think we've all been in that position. And um, it's okay. The idea is that we know where we are so that we can actually craft a good path forward. Um, when I think about the clients that I'm currently working with, I think this matches up really well. Um, there are some leaders who are doing very well and feel like they have sort of kept it all together and they're able to really practice leadership as they have always wanted to. Um, I think it's also the fact that some organizations have done a really good job at managing exposure. Um, you know, we think about the blood break and bruise, which are always important. I'm also very focused on SIF, those exposures where you have the potential for serious injury or death. Um, so I think that's very reflective of what we're seeing. Um, you know, it's not surprising that I have a few things to work on. I think probably every one of us on this call could say that because leadership is never done, right? You're always striving to get better. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, you know, I always think of it when I'm, I'm coaching leaders, uh, a common thing I say is that we're all a work in progress, every single one of us. And, uh, and we're, we're continuing to learn and grow and, and getting feedback is, and can, because can, can be very important. Um, so all of these questions that Rebecca shared are areas that build connectedness, but what can get in the way? Derailers are those things that move leaders in the opposite direction of connectedness. This can include behaviors like bullying, which is the abuse or mistreatment of someone vulnerable. Um, and it's, it's typically by somebody stronger or more powerful. By definition, a leader is more powerful, right? Than, more powerful than those who report to that person. And while someone may push back against a coworker who gets aggressive with them, they may be less likely to do so with a boss. We tend to think of bullying as those overtly hostile acts like violence or yelling or throwing things. Think of those bullies on the playground, right? But in the workplace, it's, it's not typically that. It's often nonviolent but visible acts like humiliating people or spreading rumors or, or maybe silencing someone in front of other people. And it can also be more covert kind of hidden things like gaslighting people or withholding important information that they need to do their job or resources that they need to do their job. It can be excluding people from key conversations. 30% of Americans have suffered abusive conduct at work. This is about 48.6 million people. Another 19% have witnessed it. Not surprising to anyone who has been on social media, uh, bullying is more likely to happen virtually than in person. So it's something to think about as more organizations are doing virtual interactions, as we're, as we're trying to create vibrant work groups and we're trying to, to get our work done in a virtual type setting, there's actually an increased risk of these kind of behaviors that, that can derail where you wanna go. And another thing to keep in mind is about 65% of those who do bullying are people that are in leadership positions. Now, derailers don't have to be something as, as sort of clear cut as bullying. They can also be seemingly minor but systemic behaviors, things like talking over people, um, interrupting them, not listening. If, if there's this pattern of these kind of behaviors, um, it can break trust. And when you break trust, you cut connection. Now, aside from the, the many negative implications that you would, you would have when these behaviors uh, are happening and, and the implications and the impacts on a thriving culture, once trust is broken, your ability as a leader to connect with people, to influence people, is going to be severely damaged. You know, think about it. The, the first thing Rebecca bulleted in her list of, uh, of back to basics that she underlined was about credibility. Right, so how can you tell people I care about safety and people's well-being is important at the same time be doing some of these toxic things? Um, and so, you know, when you break that trust, your ability to influence is damaged. 
The other thing to think about is that in an environment where leaders behave in this way, there's a direct impact to controlling exposure and protecting people. In these kind of environments where you have these disconnected leaders, employees are going to be less likely to raise concerns or approach others or share ideas on how to control exposure or volunteer for initiatives to do so. Um, a simple way to think about it is that if you have a culture led by leaders who engage in behaviors that break trust, it can easily become toxic and a toxic environment draws attention away from controlling, controlling exposure. One thing to keep in mind is that because leaders are the ones who create the culture in an organization, it's really problematic if you have leaders of leaders behave in this way. So if I'm a leader and I've got other leaders that are my direct reports, I'm basically inviting them to model these same undesirable behaviors. And that just increases the toxicity in the organization. And all of these behaviors that, that break connection and push an organization um, in the, in the opposite direction really of safety excellence. So Rebecca, what can you do to, to build connected leaders in your organization? Lots. I just keep looking at those, those numbers, 30%, 19%. I mean, that's almost 50% people have either experienced or seen it. And I, I just think that is so sad. Yeah. So I think as leaders, we have an obligation to fix that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we got a question in from James uh, that was around that he works in the government sector, which is not mm -hmm. known for accountability in most areas, safety included. Uh, the biggest, um, this is what he wrote, the biggest challenge I have seen that limits accountability is that many employers are afraid of losing employees if they don't hold, hold employees accountable. Have you seen this in most other segments? And I, I'm, I'd like to hear your answer, Rebecca, but I'm definitely seeing it just because the amount of turnover out there, the amount of, I think every organization I'm currently working with is really struggling with filling, with filling their headcounts. And so there, there is that fear fact. You know. It's so hard to recruit people. You don't want to do anything that is going to encourage them to leave. But I do think that there is a way to position accountability that is more positive. Accountability gets a bad rap because we don't pay enough attention to the ability standpoint, mm -hmm. right? We jump right to, you did this right, you did this wrong, and it feels unfair to the employee. Mm -hmm. I think if you practice what I'm gonna call good accountability and really first off, make sure the person is positioned to be successful, I think your odds, odds go up of success. And when things do go sideways a little bit, you have invested in that person. So you're in a position to say, look, we, we tried to set this up for success, didn't quite work. Let's figure out what went wrong so that next time um, the performance that we need happens. Um, but I, I see the same thing. Leaders sort of steer away from accountability because they don't want anything unpleasant. They don't want to drive people out. But I think that's the heart of the problem. Accountability done well is not not unpleasant. It's really about supporting the employee to get great performance. Yeah. So that sounds easy to say. I know it's very difficult to do, but I, I absolutely see it happen and I know it's possible. Yeah. I think the other thing in, the, in that space as well is, is oftentimes I hear the term accountability be almost synonymous with punishment. Yes. And that's really not what it's about. To Rebecca's point, there's ability, right? There, there's ensuring that, that the people that you're holding to account have the tools and the resources and the training and, and everything in the system that they need to be successful. And then the, the account part, going back to feedback skills, right? We want to always obviously be giving positive feedback. That's part of accountability too, right? Somebody, you ask somebody to do something, you make sure they have the tools for the job. They knock it out of the park. You know, my goodness, make sure that you celebrate that. And then if they don't hit it, um, being able to have a conversation where you give feedback, but it's more in, a, in the vein of troubleshooting of, hey, we're going to assume everybody wants to do a good job here. And so mm -hmm. if somebody isn't, or if there's a bunch of people with the same issue, let's figure out why, you know, let's work in partnership to sort this out. Um, and that's a lot easier for people to take versus just sort of knocking people upside the head um, if they don't achieve a goal. 
I think what you just said really struck me in that when we use the word account or accountability, we tend to use it punitively, like there's going to be accountability for this. And I think we have to change our language. Accountability is about driving excellence and performance. And as leaders, we have an obligation to make sure we're doing our best to help people succeed. And I think reframing it can also help in this situation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Rebecca, so talk to us about what do you do? Do you want to build connection in your organization? What do you do? So this is very possible. And I want to try and make this very practical. So this is assuming that we are in agreement that connected leaders are important in an organization and will help the organization succeed. First off, you really have to take a look at where are you in terms of connectedness? Are your leaders connected? Do they know how to do that? Do your employees feel connected? Because I think it's one thing for leaders to say I'm connected, but the real test is, do your employees feel connected to you and to the organization? So you have to take stock. And then I think you have to spend a little time thinking about what you want the future to look like. So in most organizations, we want people who feel respected at work, who feel like they can raise concerns, ask for help, um, enjoy coming to work, find the work challenging, um, experience a sense of belonging. So you have to really pinpoint what are the attributes you want as a leader in your organization, whether that be a large organization or your slice of the organization. And then the next step is looking to see what abilities am I gonna to need to build? I would bet today, if you look in your own organizations, you have individuals who are really good at this already. You yourself may be very good at this already. So the question is, how can I, how can I translate that in a way so I can bring more people into that realm where they not only feel connected, but they actually know how to go about doing it? And I do think, I always like to note here, we spend a lot of time talking about the employee experience and making it the best that we can because we know that we'll bring out not only the best in employees, but retain them. I wanna make sure that we always get leaders in that discussion because I think leaders also need to have a positive experience at work. Um, they're critical to our success. And when you look at the numbers, we're not just seeing turnover in the workforce we are seeing turnover at a high level in the leadership ranks. That's from first line supervisors all, all the way through to your more senior leaders. And we're losing so much experience because of that. The other thing I would say about building abilities is I wanna take you back to the basics. So it's helping leaders understand that how do you go about this is you demonstrate respect. You look for ways to collaborate and bring people into problem solving. This isn't going to happen outside of the work. We have to be honest about that. A lot of us have development plans. We're all very committed to helping our employees develop, helping ourselves develop. But many times it just gets pushed off the plate because the plate is overflowing. So you have to be practical and get real about that and look at how can we do this sort of in the path of the work. I think another thing to think about in terms of building ability is we, we, we use the term transformational leaders. What exactly is that? Those are individuals who really model what we want to see in an organization. They're engaging. They're able to challenge people to think differently. They're able to talk about the future in a way that inspires people, want, helps people want to be part of that. They're known as a person of influence, someone of trust. And I think you want to look around and find those individuals in your organization and really call out what are they doing that is so effective. And that will give you a chance not only to reinforce those individuals, it also gives you the ability to pinpoint exactly what they're doing. So you can get really specific about, there's a person who does a great job of giving feedback good performance, bad performance, they're very effective at it. And they're able to do it in a way that preserves relationships and builds connection. Let's figure out what they're doing and see if we can help others do more of that. 
I think this is a real opportunity in organizations. Um, and I think people want to feel connected. Whether you're a brand new frontline employee or a first line supervisor or a very experienced senior leader, um, we're humans and we, we like to connect to each other. And I also think it, it gives um, a sense of security. You know, as humans, we don't like uncertainty. We don't like it when we don't know what to do. It increases our stress and I actually think it increases disconnectedness. And so looking for ways to talk about a compelling vision in a way that people can understand and relate to and see themselves as a part of, bringing some stability back into the workforce, I think that's not only gonna help operational excellence, it definitely has an impact on exposure control because the more you operate in control, better safety is. But it makes the workplace a place people wanna be. So they feel a sense of belonging and they feel like that they matter, not just that their work matters, but they as individuals matter. I think the payoff for investing in this, um, it's just huge. Yeah. You got me on my soapbox, Angela. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, I don't have much to add with this. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're all humans, regardless of what level of the organization you're in. Um, and sort of root stuff, right? People want to feel connected. It's it's biologically important to be connected to other humans. There are you know scary uh, cougars and whatnot out there that could eat us. Um, so we want to be connected. We want to feel like we're part of a team. We want to feel that we're valued. Uh, and when an organization displays that, not just through words, but through actions, mm -hmm. and people truly believe it, it builds the connection. And not only does it make it just a, a more pleasant space to work, where we spend a lot of our time, uh, a good portion of our, of our life in work, um, in workspaces, you know, not only does it make that better, um, but it leads to more, more of a positive uh, outcomes for safety and other things um, as well. So it's really important. Um, I know, uh, uh, Rebecca, you had some questions that you yes. wanted uh, to suggest to folks. I want to strongly encourage a little homework here. So I have three questions. They're very straightforward, but they can be very, they can be transformational for a leader, for an individual. Um, I want to walk us through that and challenge you to think about this as you go about your day and the rest of the week. But we have one more day next week. Um, these are questions that you can use to sort of prime yourself or tee yourself up at the beginning of the day. The first one is, what do I want others to think about me? I'm gonna interact with people across my day and some of those interactions are gonna be little, they're gonna be complex, they're gonna be planned, they're gonna be sort of surprised they just happen, but have a strategy for what is the experience that I wanna create when people are interacting with me? What do I want them to think about me? I know I want them to think about the work and fixing problems, but I, what do I want them to think about me? That I care about their success, that I want to connect with them in a way that's meaningful, that I want to make sure that as an organization we succeed. And so I wanna make sure each person is doing well, um, that I'm kind, that I'm a good listener, whatever that is, that's a very personal question. But what is it do you want others to think about you after an interaction? And I would encourage you as you think about this homework is get really practical. So you're going into a project review meeting. You're going into a budget meeting. You're sitting in on a safety meeting. What is the impression that you want to leave with others when that is over? The next question I think is just as important is what do you want others to think about themselves? So in that interaction, are you able to ask questions? Are you able to clarify, even challenge to help the person think about how they contribute to this in a positive way? And then the last one I would star. In today's world, leaders need advocates. There's only one of you. And whether you're leading a small group or a large group, there's still only one of you. And there's so many hours in the day. And I know most of us just, our days just have gotten so long and complex. They're just never done. So as a leader, you want to have people who will speak of you, speak well of you on your behalf. 
And so that's the last question is intentionally, as I approach this interaction, when it's done, what do I want the person to say about me when they go into the lunchroom, when they're out on the floor, when they're walking a refinery or in a mine or in a meeting in, corporate, in the corporate office? Um, these three questions can really help you. And it doesn't take very long, but I would put them at the beginning of your day in your, I'm gonna date myself, a day timer, uh, whether you keep this in Outlook or you send yourself a message or an invite in, in Outlook or in Teams. Um, but I would take just five minutes and I would ask myself these three questions and sort of think through, how do I want my day to go? Because as a leader, your ability to influence is huge. You wanna be leveraging that in the very best way that you can. And I'm always, I'm always interested in people sharing, sharing with me when they do this, how it works for them. Yeah, yeah Rebecca, uh, Pedro just made a comment. He said, um, true, and at the end of the day, it's about, uh, it's about how do you make people feel? Yes. And, you know, when I've talked with lots of leaders over my career, and when we have conversations around, you know, what was the best boss that you had? You know, who was somebody that really impacted you in your life? They, talk, they, they don't talk about the task, right? They talk about connectedness. They talk about the relationship. They talk about how that person made me feel. Yes. Um, and so, you know, sometimes this stuff can seem sort of soft and sort of fluffy, um, but it really is, it's, it's connection. Um, and if you want to influence, you got to be connected to folks. The, um, I, I do this. So I, uh, or I, I try my hardest I'm, I'm, um, at asking myself this each morning, uh, those three questions each morning, and then reflecting on the end of, at the end of the day of, of you know, how did I leverage my interactions to hit those three questions that Rebecca asked, you know, and how can I do better? Um, I'm going to take it one step further. And so probably all of you have somewhere on your desk, I have one right here, grab a post-it note or grab a piece of paper and create a vision of, of the leader that you want to be this year. So on your piece of paper or post-it note, write down one word that characterizes how you would like others to see you as a leader. And go ahead and do that. And my challenge to everyone is, is to keep this word in mind. It's the beginning of the year, right? We've all made resolutions recently. Um, you know, put this post-it note right on your monitor and every day really consider, you know, how, what can I do as a leader to align my behavior with, the, with this goal? And to ensure that everyone you come, come across sees you acting in a way that's consistent with this word. And with that, uh, I would love to, to open it up to questions. Well, thank you so much, Angelica and Rebecca, for sharing your expertise with us today. Just a reminder for our attendees, you can ask a question by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, typing in your question and hitting that send button. Before we start the Q&A, I want to let everyone know about an evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. The survey will open in a different screen after this webinar. And your input is really important to us because it does help us to improve our future webcasts. Well, let's get to some of those questions. So Rebecca, I want to start with you and feel free to jump back on that soapbox for us. <laughs> um, we, we got a question in and someone says, sometimes I sense a little disconnect among my team during Zoom calls. What, what are some ways to make that setting more lively, to mm -hmm. foster more participation and, and to make it a place for positive feedback? I spend hours every day on Teams calls also. So I know, ex I know exactly the challenge that you have just surfaced. Um, I think there are a couple of practical things that you can do. One is I think you have to talk about it with your team, that this issue of disconnectedness is a challenge. You worry about it because even though you're not in person, these meetings take time and you wanna make sure that time is really well invested. Um, a couple of the things that I do that may make people crazy, but I still do them because I think it helps, is I want people on camera. I think it is much easier to stay connected when you can see each other. It also makes it harder for me to multitask or get distracted. And then I think looking for ways to give feedback to the group at the end of the call, to share your appreciation for people you know, hanging in there 
for keeping their cameras on um, and for making their time together as valuable as you can. The thing here is you can't just do it once. This has to be a practice that you really help install and continue. Um, I, can, I can't see that we're ever gonna stop doing Teams calls. Um, there, you know, there's some things that we can return to the world of work as it was before the pandemic. Teams calls, I do, or virtual work, I do believe it's here to stay. And so I think it's starting to cultivate uh, good, good behavior on team calls. And a couple of those things is people have to be prepared. Um, they have to come and they have to stay on camera. And that makes it easier for you as the person who's called the meeting to make eye contact, to ask questions. All of those things help with engagement. Excellent. Thank you for that. Angelica, did you want to add something? Yeah, um, the two things jumped in, into my mind. One was... Um, I, I can't speak for everyone, but I know I experience this a lot where with, with Teams callers or Zoom calls, it's back to back, right? Um, and so it's very easy to fall into, okay, my one o'clock call just got off. Boom, I've got to get on that next call. Let's get to business. Um, and just taking a minute of chit chat. Um, so just connecting, hey, how was your day? Or, oh, you know, I know your kid was playing a soccer tournament this weekend. How did it go? Just having that water cool, cooler conversation that we miss when you're in a virtual environment. Um, the other thing is, as a leader, try to avoid talking at people. Um, and instead, you know, maybe bring up whatever the topic is and ask those open-ended questions. Get people to be part of the conversation um, while you're doing it to get that engagement. Can I just add one more thing Absolutely. That, that we have been doing that we actually, we really like? Um, and we're, we're not there completely, but it's helping us, is we've made a practice of keeping our meetings to no more than 45 minutes so that you have a 15 minute buffer between going from one meeting to the next. And even if you run over a little bit, you still have a buffer. And that does help people to refresh. And I think that helps with the level of engagement on the next call. Yeah, yeah. Great. Angelica, I'm going to come to you with the next question. And our audience member says, between this presentation and other places, I've heard the term gaslighting a lot lately. Mm -hmm. Could you explain a little bit more about what that's about and what it means? Yeah. So what a, uh, I think of a simple way to describe it. Gaslighting is when someone is basically sort of telling you that what you believe truth is, isn't true. Um, so you may have experienced something and someone's like, oh, well, that's not what happened. And you know, for darn sure, that's exactly what happened. Um, and it, it can kind of have you questioning your sanity a little bit. Right. Um, and, uh, so that, that's what gaslight lighting is in a, in a nutshell. Do, Rebecca, do you have a better description than, than that? No, but I know I've experienced it. <laughs> <laughs> It's where we keep the seats. <laughs> yeah, they, they challenge you in a way that's not helpful and really sort of call what you've said to be false and not true. Um, and not only does it feel ter terrible at the receiving end, but I, it doesn't create the sort of respectful, uh, collaborative environment that you really need in, in, a, in a group setting to be successful. Great. I want to come, uh, Rebecca, to you with this next question. And I think all of our attendees can probably feel this at some point. And our attendee asks, when our team loses a good person, how do you regroup and ensure that we're remaining connected, leaders are remaining connected to those who are still on the team? I don't know if this is good or bad, but we all have lots of opportunities to practice this right now. Sure. Um, I think when you have someone depart the team for whatever reason, because sometimes it's positive, right? They're promoted or they get to go on a special project. But when the team is disruptive, I think as leaders, we have to recognize that. And if you're familiar with sort of the basics of, of team forming, so forming, norming, storming, performing, that's the easy way of describing it. Um, whenever you lose a team member, you have to go back to the beginning and make sure that there's clarity in roles and responsibilities, that there's an opportunity to grieve for the loss of the person. Grief sounds very severe, but it, it really is. You feel like that person's leaving you, especially if they've done something vital on the team. So you want an opportunity where people can reflect on that, acknowledge the great things that person did, and talk about what you learned from them and 
how that's going to get incorporated going forward. But I think you have to pay attention to making sure that the crew goes through those process, those, those process steps, maybe quickly, but still that it's intentional. Certainly. Angelica, anything you'd like to add to that one? Uh, no, I think she nailed it. Okay, great. Well, Angelica, I'm going to come to you. It looks like we have time for one more question today. Okay. And you can see on the screen there a, a QR code. Feel free to use your phone to uh, go ahead and get some more information about the folks at DECRA. Um, Angelica, one of our audience members says, you know, appreciate the feedback. This all sounds great. But is there a certain place or a first step, a, a way to start mm. this process? The answer depends on whether you're talking about yourself or your organization. Um, so let's let's go with yourself. Um, I think it really starts with that those questions that Rebecca covered in that back to basics slide. Um, really having that self reflection um, because we can't move forward if we don't know where we are. And so really taking that moment uh, to go, okay, you know, how, how am I doing? Um, you can also ask for feedback from other people of saying, hey, you know what, I want to be connected with people. Um, you know, it's part of my value system, but I always think about intent versus impact, right? So I know how I intend to come off to the world, um, but that's not necessarily how what I do lands. And so being able to get feedback from others, um, whether it's just one-on-one -on -one feedback, whether it's some type of, of leadership diagnostic, um, getting some feedback on um, where your gaps may be um, can be really valuable, valuable in determining where you, where, uh, where you want to go and, and how to get there. Great. Well, folks, unfortunately, we have run out of time today. We thank you all for attending today's presentation, and we would appreciate you taking some time to fill out our feedback survey. Uh, a special thank you goes out, of course, to our terrific presenters today, Angelica Grindle and Rebecca Timmons, and everyone from our, font, our sponsor at DECRA. This ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. Take care, everyone, and have a safe day. Take care, Thanks everyone. Thanks very much.